I am excited to introduce you all to our next historian. Um, Professor Nina Makareg received her doctorate in Islamic art history from the University of Minnesota and has worked at, uh, Professor, you're gonna have to help me with this pronunciation, um, Koch University in Istanbul, yes. <laughs> as well as the Kunstist, can you help me with that one? At the Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence, Italy. <laughs> and, and Stanford, <laughs> yes. Uh, she specializes in Ottoman architectural history and her research on Turkish bathhouses contributes to the fields of Islamic, Ottoman and modern Turkish cultural architecture, social and economic history. Um, Professor Makareg has, um, is now in a, in a new career and currently runs a kite surfing shop in Long Beach. So with, with that, let's go ahead and welcome um, today's scholar. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Professor Makarek. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd really like to thank Daniel for the kind invitation for allowing uh, me to share with you my passion for Ottoman history and specifically the history of Istanbul, which used to be my home for about 15 years uh, before I uh, returned to the US. Um, so before I start, I would like to ask who among you actually had the opportunity to visit Istanbul. I, I think Eileen was there. If you could use the raise your hand function so that I know how many of you have been there. Okay. Wow, quite a few. Very good. <laughs> Seven. Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, still, um, I think it will be necessary that um, as I have planned to give in part one, a little bit of a background and context, and then part two, we will have a question and a breakout room. Uh, before we move on to part three about the Ottoman conquest. And uh, to me, the, I have broken this into uh, two parts, just a little bit about the role of technology in that. And then secondly, how to Ottomanize uh, the city. And I'm paying here specific attention to a monument that figured in everyday life. And that should be very relatable for everybody. Um, who, uh, who has shared in any kind of communal bathing activities, which I'm sure includes uh, uh, your, your students as well. So hopefully that will make it more relatable. And then part four, we will quickly talk about the relevance. Um, so much uh, for uh, the outline. And then as, as, I, uh, as I continue to talk, you're welcome to write questions into the chat box and I will do my best to address them and to weave the answers into, into the talk. Okay. okay, so um, the background obviously is the Ottoman Empire, which lasted from around 1299 to 1923. And so this is, of course, a great expanse of territory and also of time. And as uh, you already mentioned in the previous discussion, that means that there is a great deal of changes in attitudes towards diversity even. So it's really not necessarily very fruitful to make sort of these blanket statements about this is how the Ottoman Empire was because what happened in the 1300s, 1400s, 15, uh, uh, 1400s is very different uh, from what happened in the, in the 1800s, for example. Um, so uh, the Ottoman Empire was extremely multi-ethnic and you should be able to see from, understand that even in relation to its geography on the map here, simply because um, the, the territorial expanse encompassed so many different areas that were inhabited by so many different peoples. Um, so this, this type of, uh, of emphasis on Turkish or on one ethnicity, one language, one religion really was not the case in the Ottoman Empire until quite late with the rise of ethno-nationalism. And in fact, if you, somebody, if you called somebody before the 19th century a Turk in the Ottoman Empire, 
that may have actually been in, intended as an insult because Turk meant somebody who was uncultured, unrefined, and came from the countryside, from the mountains of, of central Anatolia, so to speak. But nowadays, of course, you know, it is sort of the, the prime ethnic identifier. Um, the way in which uh, the Ottomans defined themselves regardless of ethnicity or uh, uh, of religion or language was in all, in most cases, uh, what was also presented as an alternative to ethno-nationalism, which is Ottomanism. And that meant loyalty to the Ottoman ruler, as the ruler was also presented on the coin, for example. It meant loyalty to the Ottoman dynasty. And that loyalty would have been the glue that was holding together all of these different ethnicities, all of these different uh, confessions and, and, and languages. So the, the first Ottomans did indeed come from the East and spoke a precursor of, uh, of modern Turkish, but they extensively interacted with and very quickly mingled with the local people of Anatolia, with Greeks, Arabs, Kurds, Eastern Europeans, Italians, and so forth. Um, I mean, there's very often, even today in, in modern Turkish um, high school history, this emphasis on the Turkishness of the Ottoman dynasty. But the question is, if you keep marrying Byzantine princesses, <laughs> then how pure is sort of this pure in quotation mark, is that ethnic identity uh, going to remain when it comes to the ruling house? Um, so multi-confessional. Um, I should mention here that before the Ottoman conquest of the Arab lands, which included Mecca and Medina, uh, the, uh, the territories had a majority of Christians at po as population, because you can see here, oops, you can see here uh, around that time, sort of the, the, the area of the Ottoman Empire was almost equally distributed between Western Anatolia and Eastern Europe. And so the population there was majority Christian and it was actually not necessarily encouraged to convert simply because they paid a head tax per person, per household, which contributed greatly to the Ottoman treasury. So it was not necessarily in the economic interest of the Ottoman dynasty to encourage conversion at first. Later on, that changed. Um, but uh, again, we are not able to necessarily go into great detail here. Um, so uh, in general, if somebody among the uh, non-Muslim community or non-Turkish community wanted to participate in the ruling elite, they could convert. They could learn the languages important for government business and elite culture. And these languages were Turkish, Arabic, and Persian, and they could rise through the ranks of the court. And so there were different mechanisms for how that could be accomplished um, by uh, being sort of conscripted as, as a trainee, as a very young boy already in the court, but there were also adults who joined the Ottoman court. Um, and in doing so, strictly speaking, they would become slaves belonging to the Sultan. But when you use the term slave, it's certainly not in the US American sense of the word because slaves within that context could amass great wealth and political power if they uh, could hold office at court. And especially if they became the grand vizier, which was the second man in command after the Ottoman Sultan. And we have instances of very ambitious Italians who even uh, sought out the court and submitted themselves to become slaves and members of the Ottoman court. There is this case of two brothers who wanted to join the Ottoman uh, um, uh, court. And in, in order to do so, they actually had to submit themselves to castration because they wanted to become eunuchs. And they did so voluntarily. One of them did not survive the operation. The other did and rose very high through the ranks at court. Um, 
I think Jennifer uh, was the person who already mentioned the uh, Spanish Jews uh, that were expelled from Reconquista Spain. And uh, the, um, the, there is the story basically of, of this, this ship full of Sephardic Jews expelled from Spain who were trying to find a place, a safe harbor um, for themselves. And the Ottoman Sultan Bayezid, the son of Mehmed the Conqueror, invited them, um, sort of insinuating that the Spanish kings were very stupid to expel them because they were so skilled. They had all the languages and knowledge about trade and commerce. And would they please come to Istanbul? And to this very day, there are uh, people who, in, in Istanbul, whose ancestors can can be traced back to that community. And they've even preserved a language called Ladino, which is um, uh, an ancient Spanish, basically, mixed with Hebrew. <laughs> you, so uh, since we're already on to languages, so there are, and there were an incredible number of different languages spoken and also written in unusual mixtures and combinations. So the most commonly under the Ottomans, uh, it was uh, Ottoman Turkish. So a Turkish with a lot of Arabic and Persian in it that was written in Arabic letters. But there also existed, for example, a Turkish that was written in Greek letters and so on and so on. And then you have, of course, Arabic written in Arabic letters. You have all of these different Slavic languages um, and, so, and so on and so forth. Um, so, and I'm just, I'm, we're only talking here about the Ottoman heartlands. We're not even talking about what happened, for example, uh, in, uh, in Asia, um, where the Ottomans briefly had a foothold as well. Okay, so here, let me point out the location of Constantinople. One second. So Constantinople is here between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. So it formed um, a Geographically, this, this location formed a land bridge between Asia, Africa, and Europe. And we can see that that um, already, you know, was already in, from prehistoric times onwards. So uh, then the first, uh, so you see here, basically, uh, uh, I'm zooming in. Um, so it, it shouldn't surprise us that the city was settled quite early. Um, uh, 660 before the Common Era, it was when uh, a Greek by the name of Bezos um, settled there, which then became uh, the the name uh, Byzantion, so the place that Bezos uh, uh, settled in. And then it wasn't until the 300s that it became Constantinople or Constantinopolis, the city of Constantine, meaning Constantine the Great. Um, and in fact, that, that name stuck because up until the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the official name of the city that you find on official documents and also on coins is not Istanbul, it is Constantinia. It is Constantinia, which is Arabic and means of Constantine or city of Constantine. Um, so Istanbul, which um, is sort of today its official name was actually just a nickname and it's again it's not Istanbul is not uh, derived from the Turkish language it's derived from Greek and it, it comes from Istonpolis which literally means from the city. Um, there are sort of like Ottoman writers like Evliya Celebi who wrote the famous travel log who uh, sort of jokingly said it was Islam Bol. <laughs> so a city full of Islam, Bol meaning full of Islam. Um, but this is really uh, more kind of, Elia Cheb is very famous for joking and sort of making up things and so forth. So um, it's kind of interesting to see that uh, what, what is sort of seen as sort of the, 
the Turkish city, in fact, has sort of a, a, a Greek origin name. Um, I just wanted to show you also a, a number of images uh, from the so-called costume albums that uh, allow a glimpse into Ottoman ethnic diversity. And these types of albums were a cross-cultural phenomenon in starting in the 16th century up into the 18th century. These are actually European uh, albums with watercolors that show different types uh, and different ethnicities. Those were very common. It's kind of like an ethnography before the emergence of anthropology. It was also a time when people would have friendship albums. So if you were an Italian merchant living in the Ottoman Empire, you would probably collect uh, in albums um, like these different uh, pictures, types of, of Ottomans, but then you would also have annotations, you would have your friends, the Ottoman friends, maybe write an Ottoman poem into um, on, on an empty page and so forth. Um, so these uh, different costume studies <clears throat> or, or sort of genre scenes um, displayed exotic clothes and customs from um, uh, from within the Ottoman Empire, but there also exist these types of counterpart in Europe. They also exist for Central Asia, for Sub-Saharan Africa, and even for the Americas, for the New World. Um, so these these are uh, kind of these are supposed to give you an understanding of the enormous diversity and also of the Europeans' curiosity about these different types that lived in the uh, Ottoman Empire. And just to show you here, so uh, the caption here says, this is an Assyrian Turk, which means an Ottoman from Syria. Um, I wasn't quite able to figure this one out, but I think it means Zenj, meaning a black Ottoman. And this here is a Greek Turk. <laughs> so uh, a, a Greek from the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so we're moving on to part two, uh, which consists of two questions um, that I uh, would like for you to discuss in uh, the breakout rooms. So these two questions are first, what aspects made Constantinople and Istanbul a site of encounter? And secondly, does traditional historiography emph actually emphasize these aspects? Um, yeah, I think uh, a lot within the traditional historiography is sort of focused on, on this Wiener versus Luther narrative, Christianity versus Islam, sort of that there is sort of this strict um, dividing line, really, uh, which, um, yes, there is a dividing line, but it is uh, sort of very permeable. It is very porous, and there were a lot of people who moved back and forth. Um, and as we talk, continue to talk now about um, the Ottoman conquest, I will try to keep addressing that as well. Okay, so. So um, Constantinople, Istanbul uh, has a really very, very long history of, um, of sieges and conquests or uh, the city trying to withstand the conquests. And uh, obviously in, in a major, um, uh, indi sorry, uh, majorly indicative of this is the existence of these fortification walls around the old city, what is often also called the historic peninsula, and then also here around the uh, Genoese colony or the Italian colony, uh, which was able, and these city walls were able to withstand most um, of the attempts at conquest. So almost as soon as the city had been founded, uh, it was confronted with the attempts of various rulers from many different uh, uh, places um, to take the city. So among them count the Arabs, the Bulgars from present-day Bulgaria, Vikings, 
Uh, the Fourth Crusade uh, sort of the, was, uh, to a certain extent, obviously successful simply because uh, the Byzantines let them into the city. Uh, and um, so then they managed to establish uh, the Latin Kingdom of Constantinople for several decades. But it was really only um, the, the Ottomans who then in the very end uh, could permanently um, take and uh, take the city and permanently hold it. And the person behind that is Mehmet the Conqueror, who ruled uh, two different periods, 1444 to 46, and then again from 51 to 81. And you can see a portrait of him here, which was painted by Gentile Bellini, by an Italian Renaissance painter in uh, uh, sorry, in the 1470s, there is a typo there. Um, so just to give you a little bit of, of a background here, I mean, honestly, I don't want to fall too much into this paradigm of a history of great man, but he is a very fascinating character and one of the driving forces behind the conquest. Also, he was not the first Ottoman ruler attempting uh, uh, the conquest. So. Um, as a person, as you can see from the two uh, ruling periods, you must have been quite um, marked by something that happened early on in his years. Uh, when he was still a teenager, his father, uh, Sultan Murat, actually um, abdicated and left him in charge. But then uh, the, the Ottoman principality sort of got into trouble and was, uh, was uh, uh, threatened by another um, uh, principality. And so he was kind of like recalled as a ruler because he was too con considered too young and inexperienced. And so that must have really very much bruised his ego as, as sort of this uh, fledgling uh, ruler, teenage. Uh, uh, and so he basically made it his mission that he it must be him who is going to conquer. Um, we know that his very favorite book was Alexander the Great's biography. And he wanted to be a world ruler just like Alexander. And so as soon as he became um, um, the Ottoman Sultan again in 1451, he began prep work for the conquest. And his education was such that it's uh, quite comparable to that of a Renaissance prince. So he learned many different languages. He learned Arabic and Persian, but he also knew uh, ancient Greek and probably some Italian, um, partially also because he needed to be up to date on, um, on the technology, the gunpowder technology of, of the time. The, the picture that you can see here, which is, you know, um, a, a Europe, really a, a very European style painting, an oil painting, was actually commissioned by him. So, you know, given that there is very often this emphasis on, oh, Islam prohibits figures and so forth, and that, that's certainly something um, that uh, uh, should give you pause that it was actually his wishes that were the driving force behind that portrait. So the crowns in the in the corners are sometimes said to stand for Europe, Asia, and Africa, sort of his uh, ambitions at universal rule. And he's really depicted in the manner of a European Renaissance ruler, and he saw himself as such. So, um, we will we kind of go ahead to the year of 1453, and I don't want to dwell too much on um, on the specifics of the conquest because I'm sure that those are part of the history book, sort of like the cunning and the tricks that were played there in terms of bringing the ships across um, the uh, this promontory here into the Golden Horn. Uh, behind the chain that the Byzantines had suspended here to prevent the Ottoman ships from entering. At the same time, there was uh, sort of a move on of the land troops against it. So the topography really also plays a huge role in the, um, in, in the narrative of the uh, conquest. So why were the Ottomans successful at that point? 
well, there are, you can sort of uh, break this down into many different uh, parts. First of all, the condition of the Byzantine Empire at that time, um, as this map shows, the Byzantine Empire was whittled down to very, very little. So these, these pink parts here are what is left of it. So the question is how long could they really withstand um, uh, the pressure of the Ottomans, which had already taken this part and that part of, of the former Byzantine Empire. Then also, of course, the question of personal ambition, and I've already addressed that sort of well with, uh, with some of the biographical elements of Mehmed the Conqueror. And then technology also plays a huge role here. Um, so the term gunpowder empire has already uh, come up and um, it was, it was uh, to a large extent the, uh, the, cannon, uh, the cannons that uh, the Ottomans were able uh, to produce and use against the Byzantine city walls that made them successful. And there is one uh, very interesting uh, character here that we should mention, and this is Urban, also sometimes known as Orban. So he was a cannon caster, possibly of Hungarian origin. Um, and he visited the court of the Byzantine Emperor Constantine Palaiologos, um, and he tried to basically sell his craft, his skill, this technology to to the Byzantine emperor, but Constantine didn't have the money to pay the fee, uh, sort of the, uh, to pay for ur urban services. And uh, he didn't, he even didn't have the materials. So Urban then left the city, went to the Ottoman uh, Sultan Mehmed II and reached an agreement with him. And then they did a trial run um, where, and that involved um, the, urban casting a cannon that was set up on the Bosphorus Straits and uh, the Ottomans basically cut off the Straits and when a Venetian ship tried to pass against the Ottomans wishes, they blasted it to pieces. And then uh, after this kind of trial run, Urban went to the city of Adrianople and managed to cast there a huge cannon. Um, this is not the cannon, but this is one that was pro is probably cast after a mold uh, used by urban um, and that cannon uh, was 27 feet long about three feet in diameter and it could fire a stone projectile weighing about 1500 pounds so i mean really it is just a question of time until the byzantine kind of have to um, uh, the, until the byzantine city walls uh, crumble uh, in in, uh, in the force of this Okay. So the traditional historiography, the conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans, of course, sends shockwaves through Europe and the Middle East and, and so forth. Um, and it, the, the long-term consequences of this will even reach into uh, very unexpected corners. For example, later in the 15th century, it was another very ambitious man who wanted to secure funds for a campaign to reconquer Constantinople for Christendom. And with that goal to secure funds for that, for that campaign, he set out across an ocean. Who would that have been, you think? Columbus. Exactly, yes. So, I mean, it's very interesting to see how these different um, um, kind of what we would consider milestones uh, in history, how these are connected. Okay. So um, following the conquest, Mehmed the Conqueror needed to revive the city or to somehow Ottomanize the city. And again, even like in modern day Turkey, when you talk to people about uh, like research that you're doing, oh, I'm working on the transition period between the Byzantines and the Ottomans, a very common response would be, what do you mean transition period? We took them <laughs> almost as if, you know, today you're speaking Greek, 
However, the Turks took over and tomorrow you speak in Turkish and you forget everything that came before. <laughs> Obviously, this is not how it works historically. There is always a period of adjustment, a period of transition and so on and so on. So um, we will uh, think a little bit about that uh, transition period. And I would like to start with a quote here that comes from Mehmet's court historian Kritovulos, who, as you, by, you may uh, realize from his name, was actually a Greek. <laughs> so he, meaning Mehmet II, called together all the wealthy and most able persons into his presence, those who enjoyed great wealth and prosperity, and ordered them to build grand houses in the city, wherever each chose to build. He also commanded them to build baths and inns and marketplaces and very many and very beautiful workshops to erect places of worship and to adorn and embellish the city with many other such buildings, sparing no expense as each man had the means and the ability. So Mehmed the Conqueror was very um, aware that he needed to revive the city, he needed to come up with ways to keep the non-Muslim population even in the city. He needed that the city's population to turn the wasteland that Constantinople really had become in the decades before and also during the siege back into a thriving city. He needed people to stay, to do trade and to contribute to the economy. And so clearly you need to um, secure an infrastructure to make that possible. So he constructed palace, his, his own palace as a seat of government. You can see uh, the top couple palace here as his own residence, but also residence for his officials. Immediately after the conquest, he actually gave away houses and residences for free to people who decided to stay in the city or who would come to the city. He gave them tax exempt status for a certain amount of time. He protected places of worship to a certain extent, among them the Hagia Sophia. Uh, but then of course he also erected new places of worship and one example of that is the mosque of Mehmed the Conqueror. Uh, he built that mosque smack dab in the center of the historic peninsula of uh, Istanbul on top of the Church of the Holy Apostles, which, was, which had been built by Constantine the Great. So he built his mosque on top of the church that the founder of the city had built, uh, which was also where the tomb of Constantine the Great was located. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that actually Mehmed the Conqueror's tomb is also part of that mosque complex. And then uh, worship is only one dimension of daily life. So he also, Mehmed the Conqueror also made sure that there were all sorts of amenities that were needed by city residents added uh, to, to the urban fabric, which includes bazaars, so marketplaces, inns or caravanserais for traveling merchants and bathhouses, interestingly enough. So I've, um, highlighted here, but even Kritovulus, the court historian, mentions he also commanded them, meaning the viziers, to build baths. And fact is that under Mehmed the Conqueror, more bathhouses than mosques were built in Istanbul, 26 to be exact. And you can see here uh, a map and a list of these. Why do you think would there be more bathhouses than mosques in this newly conquered city? So there is again uh, a continuity. The Byzantines had bathhouses towards the end of the Byzantine Empire. That kind of tradition um, was quite neglected, but it was still something that was there and was available. So it would be something where the, uh, uh, the Ottomans could like connect to or link to, um, to show that they're actually the inheritors of that Roman, of, of the Roman empire's culture as well. 
So yes, as we already kind of mentioned or uh, hinted at, hammams were kind of miniature sites of encounter. So you can go from the macro scale of the city to the micro scale of, uh, of the hammam, because everybody needs to attend to body hygiene and bathe at some point, whether Muslim or Christian or Jewish, doesn't matter your ethnicity, whether you're a permanent or a temporary city resident, or whether you're a traveler, Ottoman or Asian or Arab or European. So it was really a shared daily practice. Um, and I would like to just briefly look at one specific bathhouse as an example, um, which is uh, the so-called Cembelita Shamam, which dates, uh, was built in the late 16th century by a fa very famous Ottoman architect. It still stands today. You can go there and bathe there. Um, it's, it's a very beautiful building. Um, it's now open to both tourists and uh, Istanbulites, Turks alike. Mm -hmm. So what you can see here, is an Ottoman map showing the water supply system of Istanbul in the 17th century. And here you have the facade of, of the bathhouse. Uh, it's located again, right in the middle of the city. And these are commercial areas. So bathhouses would be built in areas that were very busy, that were very crowded, uh, where there would be lots of merchants, lots of travelers. Um, so that would make sure that there would be plenty of bathers who would uh, also make the hammam, uh, the bathhouse economically viable. So this is how uh, the Cimbalita Shamama more or less looks like today. So you can see that here. In the 19th century, um, a corner of it was cut off. And you can see that on the ground plan here because they built a tramway through that street. Um, and that uh, the bathhouse would have sort of like poked out into the street too much. And the bathhouse is also slightly visible here in a corner of it. Right next to it is the column of Constantine the Great that has been there since 330. So you get like this rich textured layer of different historical monuments kind of like being built next to each other and almost like talking to each other. Here you see a large group, a wedding party composed of women and children on the way to the hammam. So the hammam was a very important part of um, uh, not just of everyday life, but also of specific um, uh, festivities like preparing for a wedding or preparing um, for uh, for birth, also preparing um, for, for men before they go off into war and so forth. So men could socialize in mosque courtyards and coffee shops and bazaars and so on, but women had much fewer places where they could socialize with, with each other and still be considered a respectable woman. So um, the hammam was one place. So I'm just showing you a few views here of the hammam. So you enter through here and you have two sections. This is the men's section. and exactly parallel to it, identical, is the women's section, um, because men and women are strictly separated during the bathing procedure. But regardless of whether you're a man or a woman, you enter uh, the dressing room, where you have these cubicles and so forth, and then you continue on into the warm room, and this section, where you can get used to um, the higher temperature, And then from there, you continue into the hot room, which is kind of the heart of the bathhouse. And so you see different um, views here, how this looks like. The, the room is domed and it has like these little glass cups so that you can get light through it. Um, and then usually in the center, there is this uh, big marble slab where you lie down and you start sweating and then you can get the massage there and you can wash yourself here. Uh, in the basins and then obviously you also have uh, like these corner chambers if you wanted more privacy you can use those. 
and this is just another this is an ottoman painting an ottoman miniature showing um also how social uh, the bathing procedure is simply because um people will chat with each other they will help each other you can see these two guys here shaving uh the fellow bathers heads this one these two are also engaged in conversation and so forth so um, we also know that a hammam would have been a place where you could sing, you could recite poetry and so forth. And so the soundscape, the echoing chambers of the hammam, that would, must have been a very, very special experience. If you're interested in soundscapes um, of the Ottoman Empire, I've done some work on that too. So I've shared as a source the Ottoman History podcast. And if you're interested uh, in, in, in that element, um, there is a, sort of a, a, a nice little uh, report on that uh, available too. When we talk about uh, sort of the continuity from the Byzantine Empire to the Ottoman Empire in terms of the hammams as well, uh, the hammams were heated absolutely in the same way that the Roman bathhouses were heated even today, which is you have at the back of the building here, um, a furnace, a stoke hole, and you see this um, schematic drawing here. So you have the fire that heats a boiler that is inserted on top of, of the fire, but then also the hot air and the gases uh, are drawn underneath the floor and then they escape through the walls through the flue so it's kind of like an underfloor and in wall inside the wall heating and even today much like roman baths much like in the ottoman period you have uh, sort of a, a stoke master who who stokes the fire in the furnace okay just a few of the, a view of the different hammam employees that would work there. You had people who massaged, you had people who uh, did the laundry, you have a coffee cook and so forth. Um, and all of this, this sort of like uh, administration of the hammams can still be um, followed through accounting registers such as this accounting register from the 16th century, which is still preserved in different archives uh, in, in modern day Turkey today. Hammam visits could be done for many different reasons. We've already talked about socializing, but clearly for Muslims, it also had a component of ritual cleansing because you need to wash before, uh, especially the Friday prayer, the socializing and relaxation, but we also had hygiene and healing. So um, um, Ottomans were quite aware of the importance of hygiene for the general health, public health in the city. So bakers, for example, were sometimes required before they would go to, um, to work to wash in the hammam to ensure that they would be clean and the food that they prepared would be clean too. And then um, I think that was uh, Tracy's point too, sort of going to a hammam sort of uh, meant to uh, sightsee, <laughs> to encounter sort of this monument um, uh, as a visitor. And if you were a European traveler, of course, this was something very exotic. But if you were an Ottoman visitor, maybe from a smaller town in the vicinity or from another part of the Ottoman Empire, you would be kind of participating in this Ottoman imperial culture. Okay. So we move on to uh, the very last part, which is, I think I'm pretty much out of time anyway, which is the relevance today. So, I mean, why talk about uh, for example, the, the Hammam uh, or, or the Ottoman empire even uh, in, in, in the context that you do. Um, first of all, I think that uh, a, a, a universal phenomenon or a near universal phenomenon such as a communal bath, whether that's in the shape of a hammam, a sauna, a Japanese onsen, um, a pool even in the US, um, you have kind of like an anchor point as a shared experience that hopefully students would um, 
uh, would be able to relate to as well. Um, so one could maybe um, look at examples from other cultures you can hook in to your own students' experiences or your experiences. And I think there was Amparo who told me about the Balnearia uh, in, in, uh, in America. Something else that has come up and is quite um, uh, current, in fact, in, in, in politics right now is sort of the legacy of Ottoman inter-ethnic or inter-confessional relations in the US with um, the recent acknowledgement of the Armenian genocide. So um, given that, in the, especially in the early Ottoman period, there was such an emphasis on diversity and, and uh, kind of inter-confessional coexist, as a sort of coexistence and so forth. What went wrong there? Um, how did that happen? And finally, can we draw any lessons uh, for diversity in contemporary settings from there? So I don't know whether we have any time to discuss any of these points. Um, but uh, I uh, also just wanted to very quickly um, show you that last slide, which has some useful sources uh, that you can draw on if you um, consider uh, incorporating some of this material into your own classroom practice. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity mm -hmm. to share some of my research with you. Okay. Well, again, let's let's provide a, a, a round of applause. A thank you to our uh, guest historian today. That was a really terrific talk.